Good afternoon. I'll just see if this works. Can you hear me? Yes. You can all hear me. That's good. Right. Excellent. Only just. Well, I'll try and speak up. Uh, so I'm <coughs> Graham Simpson. I'm a MSP for Central Scotland, and I'm a, one of the co-conveners of the cross-party group on aviation. Um, so this uh, session is organising in conjunction with that cross-party group. And that's made up of uh, MSPs from various parties, obviously, um, and also um, people from the aviation sector. So um, we were asked if we would like to host this event. I think it, it should be interesting. I should point out from, from the start that one of our speakers, uh, Mike Robinson, uh, sadly hasn't been able to make it. Uh, Mike, uh, Mike, in his wisdom, uh, chose to try to get the train rather than the plane, um, and uh, he couldn't get here. So there were, he didn't have to come that far, actually. He was coming from Perth, but there's been problems. Um, so he hasn't made it, but he has sent us a, a video, because um, when we get to the, the, the panellists, they'll all get uh, around about five, six minutes uh, to say what they want to say. Um, Mike will be up first with his video. I haven't watched it. I've no idea what he's going to say. So let's, fingers crossed. Um, I, was just, I was at a meeting um, earlier this week um, where, I don't know if you've noticed, uh, those of you who have to go to business meetings, um, nobody wears ties anymore. Nobody wears ties. And I was reflecting uh, with the people in this meeting, yes, you have, I only wear a tie now when I'm in the parliament because I think I should look smart and, well, there you go. I, <laughs> And, and there he is, Mike, Tyler's Mike. So I apologise uh, for the rest of the panellists, but I've turned up um, suited and booted and looking the part. Um, now, um, so as I said, it's, uh, it's in partnership with the cross-party group. The blurb that you may have seen um, says it's a discussion on whether something called fly shaming is obscuring the air industry's drive and advances towards meeting net zero carbon targets by 2045. I'm bored already, and I'll stop there. Um, um, but I didn't know what fly shaming was. Um, I'd, never, I'd never actually heard of it. I didn't know what it was until yesterday when one of our panelists told me it comes from Sweden, where it's called fly scam, and it recognises the guilt that people have when flying. And it was originally a celebrity-led campaign to challenge behaviours. And now our panellists can refer to fly shaming if they want, but they don't have to. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, they can say whatever they like, uh, so long as they're polite. Um, and I'm going to chair this meeting impartially. Um, I used to be a, a journalist, so I can be, I can be impartial. Um, but, um, well, even though I used to work for the, the, the Scottish Sun, um, but, uh, but, you know, I can be impartial, uh, honestly. Um, but before I get into that, um, as, as the joint convener of the cross-party group, I'm obviously, I obviously have views on aviation, and the group um, is there not to bash aviation, but I think we all accept that aviation has to improve, um, it has to decarbonise, and we actually produced a report uh, which was published in, in February, uh, which set out what both of our governments, the Scottish Government and the UK Government, uh, need to do. And one of the key calls was it, uh, they need to create a market for what's, no, what's called sustainable aviation fuel. We may get onto that, particularly here in Scotland. Now, I've got to be honest with you, on a personal level, I've never felt ashamed to fly um, this summer. Uh, my wife and I have spent nearly 24 hours on planes. We've visited five different airports in Scotland, Ireland, England, America, and uh, Canada. We uh, covered nearly 11,000 miles, and uh, I discovered something called flight sickness, which was not very pleasant, but it hasn't put me off. Um, I'll, do a, I'll do it again because, as far as I'm concerned, Travel broadens the mind. Um, now, uh, my, my understanding is you lot have actually paid to attend 
you have paid. So um, we better be good, and I hope you don't ask for refunds because you, uh, you might be waiting uh, longer than it'll take to get your suitcases back at Edinburgh Airport. <laughs> we might mention that. Let's get uh, into our speakers. Um, so Mike Robinson, who'll be up first, is Chief Executive of the Royal Scottish Ge Geographical Society, uh, and in 2006, he established Stop Climate Chaos Scotland. Um, now, I'm assured that they are not the people who glue themselves to roads. They, they are not like that. They're sort of quite sensible people. Um, we also have uh, Charandeep Singh. There's Charandeep. Uh, Charandeep's the Deputy Chief Exec at the Scottish Chambers of Commerce. Scotland's largest business network where he leads on business policy, internationalisation and external engagement. Uh, Gordon Dewar, to his left, is Chief Exec of Edinburgh Airport. So if you've got any complaints about Edinburgh, he's your man. Um, if you've lost your cases, he's your man. Um, he's also worked in the bus and rail sectors and Gordon is known for being outspoken uh, and he certainly was about both governments during the pandemic. Uh, and finally, um, we have uh, Finlay Asher. Finlay is an aerospace engineer. He spent eight years working at Rolls-Royce where he designed engine concepts for future Airbus and Boeing aircraft. Uh, and he's the co-founder of Safe Landing, which is a group of aviation workers pushing for long-term sustainable employment. So I think we'll just get into it now, uh, and if we can have the video, and we'll hear from Mike. We might hear from Mike. We'll come back to him. Okay, we'll come back. We'll come back to Mike. Um, so, in that case, um, what I'll do is I'll take uh, Gordon, uh, and then I think we'll take Finley after that. So, Gordon. Okay. Thank have you very much. Five or six minutes. Sure, I'll, I'll be shorter than that. I'm sure. But um, uh, hello to everyone. My name's Gordon Dure. Um, been working at Edinburgh Airport for 11 years now, but as Graham said, I've uh, always worked in transport, buses and trains before. So thank you for the opportunity to sort of come and speak about this uh, pretty important topic, um, not just for us, but I think for everyone. Um, but the opportunity is maybe not, it's not the best start point, I would argue, in the question about to fly or not to fly in the title of this, because um, it's pretty poor and narrow start to the debate, because that's rarely the question people ask yourselves. If I started from an aviation perspective, starting from an airport or an airline, you might ask ourselves, how do we fly sustainably? And then I'm sure we'll get into many of the things we can do to achieve that. But really, for a bigger question is, why do we travel? You know, what is it we're doing? Should we travel or not? And that then immediately gets into the question of the purpose of what we're trying to do, and therefore something towards the value of what we're doing. So questions like, should we go on holiday or not? Should we go on that sales trip um, to improve the benefits of our business? Or should you even go to grandma's funeral um, next week? And if you ask these questions of yourself, it's, um, it, it comes down to the value. And it's not necessarily financial value. In fact, quite often, it's a lot more than financial value, but that's part of it. And if you think about um, the choices you make about going on holiday, and if you live in Scotland all your life, then the idea of never going somewhere sunny feels quite a, a sort of dismal prospect. Um, but if you think about the economic impacts, if we stop all the other things, about economic growth, about jobs, about the tax base that we need to actually pay for health and education and to live the life that we actually aspire to, um, or even if you think more about the sort of non-business sides around culture and arts, we're in the middle of the biggest international arts festival in the world by some margin at the moment. 
um, it would be a very different experience if there was nobody flying here to enjoy that or, more importantly, contribute to that as artists. And we're in the middle of our very unsettled period in history where there's wars in just about every continent. If we think that not travelling is, is, is going to help in terms of understanding each other, trying to resolve issues, uh, trying to get into the understanding of what causes the problems in the first place, then I think we're again missing the value of travel, which is about that human engagement, that ability to swap ideas. And even at the very highest level of the sustainability challenge itself, some of the technologies we're going to rely upon are going to come from international collaboration, from universities, from business from government going forward uh, and I think getting together is a key part of all of these things going forward event. So none of that avoids the need that we absolutely do need to decarbonise and that's true of absolutely every sector and aviation quite often held up I would argue in a different light and perhaps not necessarily a fair light but one that we, we're not shirking we know we have to do things differently. But if we're going to do it, and we'll get on to, the, I'm sure, the challenges of how we make that happen, and aviation is not as quick as, say, uh, road transport, where you can already buy an electric car. That's technology that's here. We're a bit slower to get there, although I'm confident we'll get there. But if we're um, asking ourselves the question, what are we going to do about that? Then I would argue that Scotland's most important contribution to that is going to be leadership. It's about doing things that other people will want to follow, because we are a very small part of the issue. Not to say that our decarbonisation is as important as everyone else's, but in pure volume terms, if you think about the fact that in China, the increase, just the increase, not the baseline of carbon output, in the last 10 years is more than the entire UK output, then clearly doing it ourselves won't get us very far. But more importantly, if we do it in a way that causes huge harm to the economy, avoids us being able to, or stops us being able to fund the things that we value, like health and education. If we trash the economy, if we do all these other social damages in the pursuit of decarbonisation, who's going to follow us? People don't follow poor leadership. They follow things that look sensible, that achieve outcomes. And if we do it ourselves, we might be feeling very good and very um, moral about it, but we will have achieved nothing despite doing huge damage ourselves. So the challenge for me is how do we do that in a way that others will follow? How do we do that in a way that will be effective? And how do we do that as fast as possible? Thank you. OK, thank you, Gordon. And uh, move on to you, Sharon Deep. Was it Finlay? Ah, actually, it was Finlay. Yes. Let's go for Finlay. Finlay. Okay. Is my microphone working? Okay? It's good. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, so as well, thank you very much for having me here. I was just saying I've never been in this building before, so it's great as a Scottish citizen to be able to visit and be able to have such an audience and talk about something that I spend the majority of my life talking about and having people come and listen is great. Um, I think I agree with uh, everything that's been said so far, pretty much. Um, like we. Travel has so many benefits, um, uh, however you do that. Uh, being able to connect cultures, family, friends is super important. Why I set up my group, and I'll explain that in a second, is because we fear that we stand to lose everything. We, we stand to lose all of that within the next 10 to 20 years if we don't change what we're doing at the moment in our industry. Now, I'm an aviation worker, I used to design aircraft engines, spent eight years in the industry, I'm a mechanical engineer by trade. I set up an employee sustainability group within my company, Rolls-Royce, they're one of the biggest engineering companies in the UK, the second biggest aircraft engine manufacturer in the world. Um, and I set up a group of employees inside the company challenging the sustainability strategy that they brought out. And we saw massive risks in every part of the strategy. This is an industry-wide thing, it's not specific to my company. Um, everyone speaks off a very similar hymn sheet, and I think we'll, we'll get into some of the specifics of that. Um, but really, at the heart of this is definitely not in agreement with all of that stuff. Um, the, the economy, the ability to travel is, is very important. That's why we need to be extra careful and extra critical um, and explore things in depth and, and really challenge things that we've been told by leaders, whether that's politically, corporately, um, or just in the media. Um, so yeah, just a, a very brief summary is we do not have, as someone that works on the technology, was working on what's gonna come along 10, 20 years time, there's no technology or fuel that will work in the time required at the scale required to decarbonize aviation. Um, additionally, the policies we've got at the moment, policy frameworks, the main one being a Corsia scheme, which we'll explain as well, um, are just frankly inadequate. Uh, we've got massive air traffic growth planned around the world. We've planned to double the number of aircraft 
uh, being produced and in the sky um, before 2040 in the midst of a climate crisis. So I don't need to explain this to you. You look at the news um, the last couple of weeks, you, you saw roads in the Greek island on fire. You saw heat waves in China, in the US. Um, and actually this affected our industry. Um, like we were on the front lines of trying to get um, people out of those islands. Um, aircraft were grounded, they couldn't take off. There was lots of flights that were canceled. That's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the disruption that's coming when climate change will get worse year upon year upon year and particularly into the next decade. Um, so that's what my group's about. It's called Safe Landing. It's for aviation workers within the sector. We've got pilots, air traffic controllers, engineers, airport workers, airline staff, cabin crew, air traffic controllers. And we all just get together and we say, actually, we're really worried about the consequences, the impact our industry is having on the planet and also to our very industry ourselves. This isn't just about morals and doing the right thing for the global south. This is actually about self-interest and our future careers. I'm 33 years old. I hope to have a career for the next 30 odd years. I'm going to be living and working through this. This is going to affect me. So I want to hold people that are in leadership positions to account and, and ask them questions and have good responses. So hopefully we get into that in the discussion this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Finlay. And we'll go on to Sharon Deep and then we'll try the video again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Graham. Um, and like, like others, uh, really good to be here tonight to discuss um, what, what is that exceptionally important topic because it hits every aspect of our lives, um, our economy and our communities. Um, and I guess the angle that I would like to share just to set the scene from a Chambers of Commerce perspective is on trade um, and why trade is um, uh, not just an important aspect of the economy right now, but actually um, for any history boffins that are in, in the room, of which I'm sure there are some, um, there has been one constant in civilization, and that constant is uh, hu human connectivity um, to enhance and develop our social connections, our cultural connections, and of course our economic connections. Um, and right now, um, the aviation sector um, and of course aeroplanes that, that form a really import, important part of that are critical enablers of Scotland's economy. Um, not just here in the UK, but also um, in many other economies around the world that rely on aircraft um, to send their uh, goods, particularly time-sensitive goods. So in Scotland, salmon, for example, which is a £600 million uh, industry, um, and those rural communities rely on exports uh, to thrive and to survive um, and to keep people in those regions. Um, so air aircraft play a really important part in those communities. Um, or other countries like Kenya, for example, that have a thriving uh, industry to export uh, freshly cut flowers. They rely on aircrafts to be able to do that because no other mode of transport would be able to send our produce in a time sensitive um, and high quality manner. Um, and from Chambers of Commerce perspective, we need to balance um, e economic uh, protection uh, in these communities and our international partners. The chambers are a global international network, so we don't just care about Scotland or the regions that we operate in. We care about every uh, international economic region. Uh, but we also, of course, have to balance the impacts of our activity as a business community. Um, so things like regulation uh, are really important um, because they have to exist uh, to allow businesses to operate, but also protect the communities that we operate in. Uh, so we take a very active role in trying to develop and inform what that regulation could look like. Um, so from our perspective, it's not an either or. Actually, both are exceptionally important. Um, so it's going to be a big challenge, uh, and, and it is right now. Uh, there are no easy solutions, but there are solutions out there that the industry are developing, investing in, uh, and implementing. But of course, as Finley said, um, will they be the answers to all of the problems that we're facing? Uh, well, no, um, but they're an important contributor, whether it's sustainable aviation fuels or whether it's um, amending uh, flight policies in terms of how long they should be taxing on the runway. Um, every um, policy um, that we can tweak or introduce uh, is a very important part to achieving net, net zero. Um, and we do not believe um, that sh shutting down the industry, uh, and I was... Uh, very curious about how big the aviation sector was before I came tonight. Um, and I do like my stats. And uh, the global aviation sector, if it was a country in its own right, would be 17th. If 
by global GDP, which, be the, which would be the same size as Indonesia's and the Netherlands economy. Um, so it's a massive global sector. Um, we have to navigate it in that way. Um, and from our perspective, we also work with international chambers of commerce to make sure that policies that we're implementing in Scotland and the UK, where, the, where they are good and they're improving conditions, can be applied globally and vice versa. Um, so like Gordon said, um, it's a very important topic that we have to tackle from a global community perspective, but maintain um, our economic uh, activity, uh, jobs, uh, but also have an eye on the long term as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chairman Deep. I, I think we should applaud the three speakers so far. And we can applaud the technicians if they can get Mike, Mike's video to work. Good evening, my name is Mike Robinson. I'm the Chief Executive of the Royal Scottish Geographical Society and I'm currently also Chair of Stop Climate Chaos Scotland. I've been involved in climate change and environmental issues for probably 25 to 30 years um, and been very heavily involved in a number of government advisory groups and across the whole of civil society. I guess I'd start by simply saying that we've been having this conversation about aviation for a long time. The first public conversation I remember was back in 2008 and here we are 15 years later ostensibly having the same conversation. We need to do something about flying. Flying emissions are some of the most impactful individual emissions any of us can have. Taking a long haul flight can equal the total number of emissions from an entire household in a year. So this is clearly a really critical issue. And flying is responsible for more probably over 3% of emissions. Now flying could arguably be accused of being responsible for 5% of emissions because the emissions happen at high altitude and therefore have a high, much higher impact, much greater impact than they would at lower levels. And that means there's a multiplier to the emissions that come from aviation. That's actually acknowledged in the 2009 Climate Change Scotland Act, which features not just aviation and shipping emissions as part of the counting metric, but it also has a multiplier for aviation. Slightly astonishingly, knowing full well that the multiplier should have been set between two and three, um, so that all aviation emissions should be multiplied by two or three times to account for that high level impact. The actual multiplier was set by Scottish Government at one, which completely negates the point of a multiplier. But the principle is there, and actually it's something that this Parliament could very easily go and rectify. Back in 2009, the big headline measure was a 42% reduction in emissions of national emissions by 2020. We've, we're actually, the important point to make is that's a 42% reduction on 1990 levels. Here we are in 2023, and we fly at least twice as much as we did in 1990. So even a 42% reduction would actually now require an 80% reduction or more. And of course in 2019, in the Emissions Reductions Target Act, the revised targets are now net zero by 2045. So the aviation industry has 20 years to get to as close to net zero as possible. Now maybe that isn't actually possible. Aviation struggles because by its very nature, it emits, it uses kerosene, most of the fleet use kerosene, they're emitting emissions at high level and we're not going to all suddenly stop flying. Worryingly though, we've actually done the opposite. A group of people, because not everybody does fly, but those that do have actually doubled the amount of flights, so maybe even more. And there's a real inequity in flying. We know that the top 10% of travellers account for a very significant chunk of emissions. So how do we make it more equitable? Should there be a frequent flyer tax, which is the obvious thing? Even the only tax that is there, and aviation is taxed less than almost every other form of transport, which is why it can afford to be a lot cheaper. But the one tax that is there is a passenger duty or air departure tax. The UK implemented that some years ago. It earns about two billion for the UK exchequer. So it's a really valuable form of taxation. And even that is, up and is, is often questioned and challenged. 
It's the only tax that currently really applies. And it's absolutely essential that we do not start incentivising flying even more than we do at the moment. Our transport system is incredibly poorly joined up. It's one of the least well-connected sectors that there is in Scottish society. Our trains are still largely reliant on infrastructure we put in in the 1880s. And we haven't done a lot to upgrade them except to connect them to London. So our priority has been getting people from Edinburgh and Glasgow to London as quickly as possible. And yet, 70-80% of flights from Scottish airports are to London. It's sort of insane. There are alternatives. We really need to think better about our priorities. I think we all know that we need to fly less, and I'd be surprised even if the industry didn't recognise that we need to fly less. There are technological things that could come along and help, and actually some of the airports have done quite a lot to try to get people to a plane more sustainably than they have in the past. Edinburgh, of course, has the tram system, has introduced um, very high car parking charges, etc. But the reality is the biggest single problem is the flying itself. So how do we tackle that? The gains that the possibilities that there might be new fuel types have been very slow to come on board. Electric as a form of um, flights, that's a possibility, but we've got We've already got fleet around now that will still be there in 2050. Planes are kept in service for a good 30 years, 25, 30 years, no problem. So we should be making all these changes now. And in fact, to be honest, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, we need to get on with this. We need to accelerate that change. We cannot keep sitting on our hands, hoping that it will go away or that somebody else will come up with some technology that might sort it out. How do we hit our targets now? We can see the impacts of climate change day to day. It is impacting people all over the world right now. And this year, we've seen that in the headlines more than ever. We're going to get to the point, if we're not careful, where there's nowhere, nowhere left worth flying to. Well, it's a shame Mike, Mike's not here because I think the, uh, he, he, he raised some uh, really interesting points there. Um, so what I'm, what I'm going to do now is uh, I've got a question for each of the panellists based on what they've just said. I didn't know what they were going to say, so I was make, making notes. Um, and then what I'm going to do is invite them each to ask the others a question, so you can be thinking of that. Um, and then I'm going to throw it open to you, which is always a risk, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll give it a go. Um, so you will, get your, we'll, you will get your say. So if we start with uh, Ch Um I mean, you, you, you're essentially saying that for your members, uh, aviation is essential to export goods. Do your members actually look at sustainability when, when they're doing export deals or does it not bother them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really important, um, well, firstly, yes, ab absolutely, it is an absolutely important consideration. Um, companies of all sizes are looking at how they can contribute to achieving net zero, but it, it would be right to say that um, each company, small, medium, large, multinational, multinational corporates, they're all at different stages of being able to do that, depending on the size of the company and their industry and sector. Um, so our view is uh, the larger companies have a responsibility to support the supply chain, particularly small and medium-sized businesses, on the journey to net zero um, and, and make sure it's a collaborative effort. But in, in terms of the exports uh, aspect, you know, I, I think it's a really important element because sometimes we forget that actually on an aircraft it's not just people that are flying on a holiday. Uh, there is um, you know, millions if not billions of dollars worth in pounds. Uh, so I've been reading dollar stats uh, for the last week, uh, but millions of pounds worth of cargo in these flights. Um, and we mustn't lose sight of the fact that it's not just people who are on holiday uh, that, that, that are on the aircraft. It is high quality, globally renowned Scottish uh, products uh, and goods, uh, mainly f f food and drink, but also pharma as well. Um, and that aspect is often forgotten about um, and we need to make sure that actually we don't lose sight of that because airlines, when they choose to operate in any country or any market, will look at both aspects of viability. Um, now, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that might be the future. We, before aircrafts 
There were other options to send these goods, whether it was by ship uh, or by rail, um, but potentially those were not the best options for these companies in terms of profitability or growth. Um, so aircrafts will continue to play an important role. Um, we do need to make sure, obviously, that um, uh, we're taking the steps that we can to support companies to continue exporting, but be net zero at the same time. But it is going to take um, it is going to take a team effort to achieve that. But there are steps that companies are taking, uh, whether it's um, joining up with other companies that have got same orders uh, on, on that cargo. Um, and if it's not an aircraft on shipping, for example, many companies share containers um, to avoid duplicating or to be sending empty containers halfway around the world. So these types of solutions and collaborations are already happening. Is it happening at the scale that we need it to? I don't think so. Uh, it's not. Um, but that's why we do need to make an effort to make sure that, that we do that. The other aspect that I think does need to be taken into consideration from a Scottish perspective is we do have a lot of exports that go from Scotland to Heathrow and then Heathrow onwards. Um, is, that, is, is, is that the future? Um, I, I would say no. I think we need to have more from Scotland to the markets direct. Um, but that, that, that is um, it's a bigger topic than it is for tonight. Okay. Um, now, fin Finlay, um, you know, you, you were very clear that from your perspective and your former colleagues in, in the industry, you think something needs to happen. What I didn't hear was what you think needs to happen. So perhaps you could tell us. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what we need more than anything else is government regulations and effective policies, right? Um, and my industry is actively lobbying against those policies. Um, which we think is really dangerous for the future of the industry and for workers. Because, yes, there is ways that we could fly that will minimise the impact on the planet, um, but we are not developing those technologies and reconfiguring our airports and our airlines and our air tra transport network um, in, in any way towards that uh, direction. And it's because of a lack of policies. Now, my industry says, we don't need those policies. Technology is going to solve it. No, it won't, because, we don't, because policy leads technology. So what policies do we need? We need to start pricing emissions. So from a business perspective, if you want a business to change, businesses think about money. Um, that's what, what counts. At the moment, you might well catch some prawns off the coast of, some mussels or clams or salmon off the coast of Scotland, send it to Vietnam to get shelled send it back here to package in a factory. You wouldn't do that if it was absurdly cheap to, to do it. So clearly, like a sensible cost driver is really important. That comes to passengers as well. If you're making a decision to go from Glasgow to London and it costs you 20 pounds on, on an aircraft and 100 pounds on, on a train, you're being incentivized to make the wrong decision and clearly financial policies matter. So there's different ways of pricing. Uh, we can discuss those. Jet fuel tax is the easiest thing, slash emissions price. Um, so Basically, burn a kilogram of jet fuel, you get three kilograms of CO2, roughly. Uh, tax jet fuel, you tax emissions. There's also the non-CO2 emissions, the contrails um, that Mike mentioned on the screen, which multiplies um, the, the, the climate impact of, of flying. Uh, and we could financially penalize those as well. And airlines would quickly clean up their act because there's very easy, actionable solutions available to reduce the majority of contrails in the sky. We've known about these for 20 years and we've sat on our hands and lobbied against the regulations rather than get on and try and fix it. So policy, 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 and also um, discard the false solutions. So there's a bunch of false solutions out here that are stopping us on these policies. I'm offsetting biofuels um, being the main ones. Um, and we need to be very strict on actually saying these things aren't going to work. We need something else. So at the moment, the only, only policy mechanisms out there are really carbon offsetting, and that just simply doesn't work. It's fundamentally flawed. Um, the United Airlines CEO, one of the biggest airlines in the world, has admitted that, yet it's the main plank of our policy mechanisms for the next 15 years. And we might not have a planet in 15 years, so does that seem sensible? We think it's very dangerous to the planet and to aviation workers. Yeah. OK, I'm, I'm just going to press you on your, your comments on biofuels. Yep. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, that you you didn't think we had the fuels. Um, but so what, what, I mean, what's your view on sustainable aviation fuel, which has been talked about a lot now? Yeah. So 
everyone in the audience you might have heard the term sustainable aviation fuel. This was a term coined about 10, 15 years ago when the industry realised that the term biofuels sounds pretty bad for very important and ecological and environmental reasons. Um, now, the majority of sustainable aviation fuel is biofuel and will remain biofuel for the next decade or two. Um, and it's really important to understand that often these biofuels are actively damaging to the environment. Um, firstly, from a land use change perspective, um, there's a study out recently by the Royal Society that showed if we just existing jet fuel use in the UK without expanding, without growing our fuel use, just that, if you want to make it from crop-based biofuels, so you grow crops on farmland, you need half the farmland in the UK. At a time when we're already experiencing land pressures, and look at the house prices, um, look at the fact that we've got all these climate impacts on farming as well, um, and so it's just not possible. So the industry is sort of saying, oh, we're, not gonna, we're not planning to do that. We're going to use bio, biomass waste instead. So we harvest some corn, there's some stalks, stems and leaves, and we're going to use the waste instead. But they have not certified, they, they, they've not commercially developed this fuel. Um, literally, there's not, there's not been one kilogram used um, in an aircraft flying a commercial airline with passengers. Um, we haven't demonstrated that we can, we can scale it. Um, and even if we did, there's, there's constraints on the feedstock, so the input to that fuel. And basically, very importantly, there's competition with other sectors. So our government's very reliant on negative emissions. That in turn is reliant on biomass waste, as is shipping, road transport, um, bioplastics. Uh, the list goes on, and there just simply isn't enough of this stuff around on the planet to even like, touch the sides of existing jet fuel use. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now, Gordon, um, I, I did rib you about the uh, baggage problems at Edinburgh Airport. I'm going to give you uh, an opportunity just to explain what the current position is and why you think you've had these problems. I know it's straying off uh, the agenda slightly, but it, it, you know, it does give you the chance to explain that. But I'd also like you um, to say what, what your airport is doing, because I know you're doing stuff to you know, try and, try and become more sustainable. So a couple of things there. And I'll not spend too much on the baggage, if you don't mind. I mean, there's, there's, two, there's two fundamental problems at the moment. Um, because there's so much disruption in the wider network, we're getting a lot of aircraft arriving with the passengers that don't have bags on them because they're not being put on the aircraft in, in hub airports across Europe or in London. So what that means is all of a sudden we've got um, you know, 150 quite unhappy people who leave the airport without the bag, and then the next day, 150 bags turn up that we've got to find a way of getting to the people and you know no matter how well you do that um, They're going to be pretty annoyed because they should have had the bag in the first place So that problem's created elsewhere, but obviously the the reputation is that we has hit it and then compounding that uh, The handling companies who operate that service on behalf of the airlines are under resourced at the moment So we're seeing significant issues around individual handlers seeing instead of getting that bag to someone within 12 or 24 hours It's been taken too long. So we've stepped in as the airport um, not not, you know, this is not an area we, we manage directly, but we've stepped in by bringing an additional third party resource in to help that happen. So while we can't stop the bags being sent to us a day late, what we can do is try and get the minimum time to get that to people so that they're not waiting for three days for the bag. They're hopefully there. So and we're seeing a big improvement on that. But it's, you know, it is one of the most frustrating things at the moment because this should have been avoidable. We had it last year for understandable reasons. I, I don't think we should be seeing it again, but um, it's, it's a network-wide problem and not, not created here, but we, we're struggling to do the best we can once we've, uh, that problem presents itself. Um, what was your second question? The second question was, what is your airport doing to become more sustainable? So we're already carbon neutral, um, and to do that, we've got a very, very modest amount of sort of residual uh, off offsetting we have to do. And I know offsetting um, sort of is a bit of a dirty word with someone. I think that's largely because of the sort of quality of some of the offsetting that's happened before. But the stuff we're still uh, having to sort of buy offsets for are things like um, fire engines. Nobody's making electric fire engines at the moment, so we can't do everything. But pretty much everything else that we can electrify, that we can reduce use we've done. Uh, we're building our own solar farm that will come on stream later on today that's generating about a third of our energy. Uh, we're electrifying the ramp so we're not having diesel generators uh, powering aircraft so on and so forth. So all that's happening. Um, really proud of that progress we're doing but uh, as I'm sure I'll be reminded by others that know about this we're about one to two percent of aviation emissions if you 
because all the stuff happens in the aircraft up in the sky. So, you know, we've done that to take a seat at the table to do everything we can, but that's not solving the problem because our issue is we're enabling aviation, which is the, the far bigger challenge. So there is, uh, you know, we're, we're part of the industry group Sustainable Aviation, where we're trying to lobby for many of the things that Finley's talking about. You know, we, we do believe there needs to be better regulation. Uh, we do need believe there needs to be better price incentives to develop sustainable aviation fuels. We do believe that we want to actually have a true recognition of the cost of carbon. What I think is missing from that debate is um, the fact that it's somehow aviation is treated differently. Uh, I just think we want a, a level playing field. Um, and when we make choices about how we save a tonne of carbon, uh, there's two elements to it. It's what do you have to spend to do that? And is that the best way of using what are ultimately always scarce resources? Is that going to be the fastest way of decarbonising the whole? And are we making sure that when we make these difficult choices and there are costs that come with it, both financial and other, uh, that that is the best answer to get there? And I think focusing on aviation, which is such a high value contributor, at the expense of looking for easier solutions or allowing more credible solutions around things like equitable pricing of carbon is going to make some bad decisions. I mean, everybody talks about the comparison of rail to, and air to uh, London. A good example, by the way, we don't have anything like 30% of our flights to London. That would be ridiculous. We had, I think we had about 40 flights a day to London um, out of many, many hundreds out of Edinburgh. So, and the reason that happens is because it's by far and away the most effective way of getting to London. People say we're not taxed. Well, we're not subsidised either, like the railway. Um, we offer a service that people want to buy and they're making that decision. But even if you looked at it purely from a carbon side, never mind the cost side, you're probably saving about £1.50 worth of carbon at the current rate of carbon, which is too low. I'd be the first to admit it. We deliberately price carbon a lot more expensively internally to manage our decisions. So we think it should be higher. But even if you take, if you take the market rate at £24 a tonne at the moment, you're saving about £1.50 worth of carbon. But if you add up all the time it takes to do it by rail, if you add up the subsidy, if you actually add in the true cost of carbon in the railway, which cause it conveniently ignores all the stations on the way, all the road network on network rail, all these other things, uh, you're probably spending, as if you were sending somebody down on business and forced them to take the railway as opposed to flying, you're probably investing about £150 to £200 worth of time and money to save £1.50 worth of carbon. Our challenge is let's take that. If you're willing to spend that, great, but let's use it effectively and actually take not one tonne out, but let's take dozens of tonnes out because we can do it far more effectively if we focus on the choices in front of us rather than knee-jerking and saying flying bad, real good. HS2, if they ever build it, which it looks like they won't, is going to be one of the most ridiculous investments ever. The carbon payback of HS2 having dug up hundreds of miles of pristine countryside, mm -hmm. having put tough millions of tonnes of steel and concrete into the ground. The carbon payback will be about 40 years compared to what you would be emitting by flying on today's technology and using today's railway. So we're investing in a 19th century technology. Do you really believe we're going to be flying around with kerosene in 20 years? I don't. So effectively, this is, you're never going to get that payback. You're going to have done all this harm to the ecology. You're going to have ripped up this pristine countryside and you're not even going to get a benefit. Never mind the fact that we're spending billions of pounds on, a, on an asset that won't give us that return and could be far better used in investing in true decarbonisation policy. Okay, some food for thought there. Now start thinking of those questions or points. I mean, it's not, not yet, not yet. Um, they're all going to get a chance to ask a, a question to each other quick fire if we can. I'm going to start with you Finley because you were shaking your head so much when Gordon was speaking. <laughs> that, that often happens when Gordon speaks but Finley. I'm wondering what you, th so you're saying um, we should have a realistic price of carbon so I'm wondering in 2030 what do you think a tonne of CO2 should cost? I, I, I can't put a number on that. What so, I, so what does Edinburgh Airport put on for, you must have a, a business risk management plan with maybe medium, low, high carbon prices. What's your high price, your medium price and your low price for 2030? Uh, we, we don't run that policy. What we do is we are treating our decisions in terms of the way we invest and we are actively treating carbon costs as double the market rate. And I don't see any reasons why we might change that. We might, we might choose to triple the market rate. But there's, the, the point I'm making about carbon pricing is it's got to be consistently applied because otherwise you're going to get perverse decisions. If, we're pay, if aviation is expected to pay £100 a tonne, but the railway is paying £10 a tonne, or industry, or education, or anybody else is paying a different rate, we will make perversely bad decisions. So everyone needs to pay the same. The challenge we've got is 
actually aviation might be able to afford to absorb huge amounts of additional cost in carbon because we're a relatively wealthy business. That's not true of the third sector. That's not true of the public sector. That's not true of many other industries that are low margin businesses, but they all provide really critical stuff. But if all we do is punish one sector which happens to add huge value to the economy to build that tax base that pays for the third sector, that pays for the public sector, all we're doing is cutting off our nose to spite our face. And let, and let me remind you, the other thing we're not going to do is persuade anybody to follow us. Could, could, could ask a specific... Well, I'll, I'll maybe allow you to come back, but I want everyone to get a chance. You will get a chance. Jaron Deep. Thank you, Kadeel. Finley, I wasn't actually going to ask you a question, but only because you declared your age earlier on <laughs> of 33. I'm also 33. So uh, from a fellow 33 year old to another, are you talking yourself out of a job and potentially other 33 year olds as well? Absolutely not. So I feel like I'd be talking myself out of a job if I just went along with the industry's plans at the moment. I don't think there will be. Um, any flying from 2035 onwards. I don't see, I think we'll see any of the economic benefits we're seeing today. I don't think we'll be able to export salmon to people in Africa, because I think a lot of people have to have migrated from Africa. Um, I think I, we need to be very careful of the salmon industry in Scotland as well. If I worked in the salmon industry, I'd be worried about the future for various reasons as well. Um, so this is absolutely about jobs. This is about employment. This is having a, not just a sustainable planet, but sustainable, secure, careers and I think the only way we can get that is by asking our leaders difficult questions and holding them to account because fundamentally they're not going to be around in 2035. Well, I don't know, do you, do you still plan to be CEO of Air Edinburgh Airport in 2035? No. Finley and yeah. I will be around. So, Finley and I will be yeah. around, so. So it matters, yeah. <laughs> oh dear, I want to talk about age, dear me. It's depressing, isn't it? Go on. Yeah, let me ask Finlay, I mean, I, I don't disagree with an awful lot you say about legislation and about getting the group, but let me ask the question, what do you think is the minimum scale that that needs to be at? Um, I would argue it has to be at least European level, but how do we get that? It's a very good question. So um, I think we, we, we need international action, um, but international action um, with, with global kind of global multilateral agreement of all 190 countries in the world. Like that's a process we've already got. We've got the COP process, which is demonstrably failing. We've got I, the ICAO um, General Assembly, which produced the carbon offsetting scheme that I was talking about earlier, which is you know, any analyst will tell you that's just going to have no impact on, on demand and emissions in the aviation sector. So that's the result of that. So I think what we need is we need to see leadership from high income, high emissions countries, creating bilateral agreements. Um, and obvious examples would be Europe, North America, China, India, um, the G20. Um, I, th I think the amount of devastation we've already uh, wrought on other parts of the world, um, our historical responsibility and our current responsibility, I think it is inherent on us to act fa first. And we've agreed to, under the Paris Agreement, common and differentiated responsibilities. High income, high emitting countries will move faster than low income, low emitting countries and groups. Um, and aviation, as we were saying, is one of the highest income, highest emissions activities that we're capable of doing as human beings, other than getting on a space rocket and going for a, for a tour like Richard Branson or Jeff Bezos does. So I think, um, yeah, so uh, we, we, what we need is governments working together more on a bilateral scale and saying we need to go further and faster than Corsia. So just a follow-up, do you yeah. think we should charge more for an aviation tonne of carbon than any other tonne of carbon? Um, possibly yes, because of the socio-economic differences by the average person that flies um, compared to the average person that heats their home or drives their kids to work. Um, at the moment, that's not the case. We're talking about having a level playing field. If any of you fill up your petrol or diesel car with fuel, you'd be paying roughly 50% tax. There's a 0% rate on jet fuel. So there's a massive, uh, massive structural socio-economic um, like injustice that's happening here. Um, and, uh, and that's just like the, the first part. I mean, I, I would say that arguably it should be higher because of the socioeconomic reasons behind it. We don't tax everybody the same income tax um, because we recognize that low income groups suffer the most. Um, so I think we need a way of shielding low income groups somehow and building that into the policy. Okay, great. So we're getting some real difference of opinion here, which is what this is, this is about. And I'm sure there'll be differences in the room. Um, before I ask you to put your hands, well, I'm going to ask you to put your hands up because I want to know, genuinely want to know, 
who in the audience has deliberately chosen not to fly and have chosen other forms of transport because you think it's too environmentally disruptive? Well, that's quite, quite, quite a number. Um, and my other question is, do any of you act actually bother to look before you make a decision on how you're going to get to somewhere, what the carbon emissions are? Yeah. Less. I would have thought that's quite a difficult thing to do, but um, well, you right, you can try, the lady says. <laughs> okay, interesting. Um, right. So it's over to you. You can ask questions of the panel or you can just make points. I think we've got a roving mic. We do. Um, so I'll point to someone. Now, this lady at the front was really eager. So <laughs> you first. I have no wish to shame our chair, but I'm actually quite surprised that you're not, you don't have a tiny bit of feeling of guilt about flying all over the place. I, a lot of us have been very aware of the problem of flying for many, many, many years. I read a book that was written at least 10 years ago called Beyond Flying. It's about a huge national conference in um, New Zealand with hundreds of delegates. One person flew and they managed to do the whole thing online, which is a perfectly possible thing to do for an awful lot of business. I take on board that an awful lot of people have relations or really good friends in other continents including myself. That's the one flight I'm allowing myself, actually, because every time I go and visit friends and relations in Scandinavia, Germany, or wherever, or when I've gone on holiday, I go to France or Spain or Italy by train. It's perfectly possible. The problem is that trains cost an arm and a leg, and flights, on the whole, don't. And it's completely wrong policy, and the whole business of no aviation tax is just a nonsense. I'm sorry, as... Um, as you, as sorry, what's his name again? Um, Mike said, sooner or later we won't have anywhere to travel to. Everyone's burn, everywhere's burning like roads and all over Greece and southern Italy and everywhere. I mean, who wants to go on holiday to places that are 40 degrees or 45 degrees, quite honestly? <laughs> People go and they just turn on the, um, the air con in the Middle East and all over the place. Well, that's adding to the problem. I mean, you know, we, we have to develop some sense of responsibility about this if we want any kind of future for our children because... Finley is absolutely right. We're not going to have much of a future, quite honestly. And I'm worried about these young people, especially the young activists who glue themselves to things. They're splendid young people. They are not yobs. They're not criminals. <laughs> they're, they're doing their best to, to raise the alarm because what's coming towards us is terrifying. Okay. Um. So th I think she had a little bit of a pop at me, which is quite all right, um, uh, on my, my, my uh, summer holiday. Um, but I don't fly all over the place. I actually chose um, this year, um, I had a couple of visit trip trips to London where I might have flown in the past, but um, I actually took the train, uh, deliberate choice. Uh, and from Edinburgh, uh, I thought the service was, was really good. Um, you can get to London in just over four hours. Um, but uh, I don't normally talk in detail about where, where, where I've travelled to, but we, we, we went, my wife and I um, went to uh, America, and, you know, that was really the most practical way of getting there, and we did visit family. Um, normally, we don't fly all over the place, so, you know, it was, a, it, was a big, it was a big one for us, and very expensive, so we might not do it again for a while. You'll be assured to know. Who else wants in? Uh, yes, up at the back there. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's uh, more of a sort of British-specific one, but um, it's great that some people are deciding to use uh, more eco-friendly forms of travel, but... Um, there's a bit of a subtext that in Britain we've got a rail system that's been left in the hands of um, very large corporations like Virgin, which are charging huge fees for journeys uh, and not necessarily paying a whole lot of tax. And it's much more expensive to take rail, as uh, Finley mentioned, than it is to fly. So some people simply can't afford to make that um, 
that eco-friendly decision. So, you know, when are we going to see a bit more regulation of uh, the companies that are running our that are running our rail through the country when there's so many people who are who are taking flights instead because it is just so much cheaper. Thank you. Okay. Does that, does anyone want to comment on that? Because that came up earlier um, in the discussion that you know rail rail appears to be uh, more expensive than. Than I, flying. I, I, I mean, I, I used to be commercial director for ScotRail and ran uh, the franchise bid for one of these horrible big corporates that you seem to dislike so much. I mean, effectively, if you look back at the history of railway, when the privatisation reversed terminal decline in usage um, from post-war till about the when was it the early 90s when um, the, the franchise system thing, and it's it's not perfect by any stretch. These businesses are making something like half a percent margin out of it, so they're not running off with all the money and making it work. That's simply not the case. Um, they are massively constrained by government diktat, right down to the timetable they have to, to have to run. And the reason it's so expensive is because it's a massively expensive thing to operate. Because at ScotRail, when I was there, it may have changed now, but ScotRail, um, for every pound the consumer put in, the passenger put in, the government put another pound in. They're not investing in anything like that in other services, I would argue, are... Um, you know, I, or, but the other thing as well, railway is not particularly equitable in Scotland. If you're a, ABC1, you're far more likely to be connected to the railway than if you're a C2D. Uh, so it's not equitable either. Um, it's not a particularly effective way of getting people to and from where they're going to go. And it's not as environmental, environmental as everyone thinks because of the massive network. Certainly if you look at the sunk cost of all the steel. Now, I'm not saying we should get rid of the railway because it obviously has a hugely valuable thing once you've got it. But what I'm saying is reinvesting in it is debatable. And throwing yet more subsidy at it is, is a really bad use of money, but it could be better spent if it's a decarbonisation investment you're looking for. So I, I, I give an example. The, the, the current subsidy level to go on the the sleeper, this marvellously touted, wonderful idea of the, the, the grand old days of railway, is we're, we're spending about £250 of government taxation money on taking somebody to go shooting in the Highlands. I, d I don't think that's a good use of the money. I have no idea why we do that, and yet we keep doing it. And it's certainly not a decarbonisation solution. If we took that £250 for every single person, you could absolutely take all the carbon from their visit to Scotland out of it. That would be a decent use of the money. Uh, so all I'm saying is let's make credible decisions about the constrained resources we have if it's about decarbonisation. But it gets all hung up in so many different things and we're just not making good decisions as to how we're actually going to take tonnes of carbon out rather than attacking one sector or the other. Okay. Can I, can I just make a point on that? Sure, and then I'm going to come to that lady down there. Just very briefly, I mean, we, we also as a group have explored, like, should we have more public ownership of the air transport network? And I think it's quite an interesting question when you've got something that's basically a bit of fundamental infrastructure, um, you know, like the water network, like the train network, um, and the air transport is kind of part of that. But we're very market led. Uh, we're hyper privatized as well. Um, but actually what we need is a transformation of air travel. Um, and it's very difficult to see how that's going to happen, like fully market led, when you've got big, big resistance to that from the, the private sector, um, for obvious reasons. Now, I'm not of the position that actually private or public is better. What I think is good management is good, bad management is bad, and you can get both in either. Um, you can give lots of examples of bad management in private and in public. So we really, actually really need to be clear on what do we want to achieve. Um, for example, HS2, not a supporter either. I think it's massively badly managed. There's other ways we could update the rail network to make it much more manageable. Final thing on subsidies um, is, is like, yeah, it's, it's expensive to put in, but then it's, it's cheap to operate. And it's, well, th there's employment that comes with the expenses as well. I mean, if, as just a thought experiment, think about a poor country. Um, is everybody travelling by, by plane or by another mode of transport? Um, are people in, yeah, just wherever you want to end up, in whichever country, are, are they all flying around if they're on really low incomes or are they using another mode? And that kind of tells you about the real cost of this. There's a lot of hidden subsidies in aviation, fossil fuel subsidies being the obvious example, and subsidies for aircraft technology and aircraft sales, um, et cetera. Um, so there's a much bigger story to that than just like aviation gets no subsidies and rail gets lots. Okay. Um. Hi there. Um, on the case of rail, I'm pretty sure there are solutions out there to make it more profitable. I think Hong Kong and Japan has a way. I don't know if like the UK can do it, the like, transport-oriented development, but that's my question. My question is more for Gordon, right? Gordon. 
what does sustainability look like for you? So you say it's not about demonizing. So on an objective level, what does it look like if you were to describe that? It's going to be a journey. We're going to have to completely change the technology of our aircraft. So the first thing we can do now is be uh, getting into more sustainable aviation fuel. And I agree biofuels are, are not the answer because we can't do the volumization of that. So if you look around at the capability, the, the reason why sustainable aviation fuel is the answer in the short term, but it is only a bridge because it doesn't solve all the problems. But you can take the, 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 the density of carbon out of that network but to the tune of about 70 to 80 percent if we go down this route, uh, assuming we get an effective way of producing stuff and getting. And the reason it matters is for the reason raised by a number of people, these aircraft are going to be in the, in the market for 10, 20 years. You can drop this fuel into an existing aircraft engine now and it works. So we can do things tomorrow. What's missing, and again, I is where I agree with Finlay, we don't have a legislative environment to make it work. And if I'll use a proxy for this, um, 15 years ago, you, you would have found that offshore wind was the most expensive way of producing electricity because of all the, the, the it was a startup business, nobody knew how to do it, it was really expensive. Um, but as a result of putting in a price for change me mechanism where people investing in that were getting a guaranteed price, a premium price for their electricity, that allowed them to invest in that. And we shared that cost across everyone buying electricity from the network for the greater good. If you did the same, and, and now it's the cheapest form of electricity generation, and of course it's renewable so it's a win-win. We're just saying let's do the same sort of thing for sustainable aviation fuel and other motor technologies. So electric's coming, although probably going to have a limit of maybe a couple of hundred miles of, of distance and it's going to be smaller vehicles. But for the Scottish Highlands and Islands, it might be absolutely perfect. Hydrogen's coming. Let's get investing in that. Same reason. Let's find ways of making these things work. That's what EasyJet are investing in now is hydrogen technology for the long-term future. Again, you're not going to do transatlantic in that, but you can probably do most of Europe with uh, hydrogen solutions that's coming. So, you know, we've just got to take steps. And my argument is not to wait for everything to be right. My argument is take the right steps forward and make sure that every pound you spend on decarbonisation is getting the maximum decarbonisation. Don't spend on it because it's, it, it's political or it's trendy or it's hitting something that people are trying to shame you out flying. Spend it where you'll get the best impact. One of the things I'd love to do is like re revisit this whole offsetting because I think it has got, rightfully in many cases, a really bad name. But if we as an industry where we can take that money and say the next, the next tonne of carbon we could try and lose in the airport would probably cost us £200. I would love to take that £200 and save 50 tonnes of carbon by investing in domestic decarbonisation of boilers. And, you know, why would that be a bad outcome? Because the council are not going to do that for localised housing because they don't have the money. The residents are not going to do it because they don't have the money. Why are we not finding ways of taking what is a wealthy industry, is prepared to pay more and prepared to uh, get on that technology route? Why are we not finding ways of taking that value without trashing the industry and, and getting rid of all the things that we add? The biggest employer in Scotland is tourism. If we start making it really expensive to get here, particularly if we do it alone and we don't do that, at least at a European level, we're just going to trash our own economy. Who's going to follow that? Nobody's going to follow that. Right. Um, some people down there. So, no, hang on. I haven't come to you yet. <laughs> just wait. There's a, there's a nice chap down the front once in. No, no. A chap down the front there. Hello, everyone. I'm Banga Likita. I come from uh, Paris in France. Um, first of all, I need to thank you, uh, all of you, for your speeches. Um, I just have uh, two questions for Mr. Gordon Dewar. Um, first of all, you, earlier you mentioned uh, the question of balance, to make a balance, right? So I need to know um, how to do that balance between um, sustainability in aviation and uh, people, economics of people. And the second one is to know uh, in your own business, in your own office, how, um, what's your um, policy to make your co-worker more sustainable in your own um, company? Okay, thank you. So I think, you know, balance about how do we, how do we reflect the fact that aviation is not accessible in the same way to everyone. I think it comes down to why are you travelling? So people are making consumer choices at the end of the day or they're making corporate choice about that. You know, so you say, you, you know, 
I, I think suggesting that poor countries don't use the plane is a bit, it, it's a bit trite. It may be true, but it doesn't help you get the answer in there. If you're using the plane to go and, um, you know, collaborate on, you know, fusion power between universities, the America, between American and Euro European universities, you're going to use the plane if you go on transatlantic, because there isn't an alternative. Now, you could use, um, you could absolutely use, uh, like, Teams or Zoom, but we know that that isn't the same quality of interaction that we get that way. So it's good for some, but it's not the ideal for all. So we've got to, these are, this is what I meant at the start, is you've got to look at your choices. So there is a legitimate choice of taking the train to London. I don't potentially find it works. I've done it when it occasionally it does suit, but arguably it's not the best way for my particular purpose. And I would argue the value that that's generating on business trips is going to be on the whole good. But we want to give people choice and we're going to give people choices not to travel as well in terms of how can we make things easier to access, more localised, circular economy. All these things are true as well. But that's not at the expense of anything else. We've got to do all of this. What I'm saying is we shouldn't spend lots and lots of money solving one sector, do not understand the damage that's done to lots of other sectors and then think we want to watch. We haven't. We've made, we've made bad decisions. In terms of what we're doing internally, I mentioned the fact that we treat carbon at double the price of the market rate and I think you know, that's maybe not enough to really drive this. But, but it is already driving consistent behaviours. And what I mean by that is if you say to people, we're all trying to cut carbon, everyone's interpretation of that across the business, whether a project team or the finance team or the marketing team, they kind of don't know how to apply that. But if you set a market rate, everyone's at least making that rational decision. So I know that where we spend a pound on a car decarbonisation, I'm getting the same value out of that in carbon decarbonising as, as I would if some other part of the business is doing it. And what we found is that also works into the supply chain. So we're now saying to our supply chain, whether it's people that are going to come build new terminal space or people providing other services, we're, we're selecting them on the basis of their carbon footprint. So we're doing a sort of little microcosm of the bigger scale policy. Now, I would argue that needs to be far bigger. It needs to be much more consistent. It probably does need to come out of the legislative background. But don't wait for that. Get on and do the right thing. OK. Right. The chap who are told to sit down. You can stand, you can stand up. Gordon, can you give us an idea of the contribution Embry Airport makes to the Scottish economy in terms of employment, GDP, it wouldn't have escaped anyone's notice walking along Princess Street how many tourists who have flown in who are spending a vast amount of money both in Scotland and, and in Edinburgh. Um, so I'd be interested to hear what your view is and, and how much you generate towards the Scottish economy. Yeah, I mean, we've done, a, we've done a few studies. I mean, I think this is, you know, you see the industry does this quite a lot and trying to understand it. And we're well over a billion in terms of added value. Um, I mean, if you think about the airport, 7,000 people work at the airport, only about uh, under 1,000 work for Edinburgh Airport as the operator. So that's 7,000 jobs and everything from retail projects, uh, UK border force, you name it. Uh, so that in itself, that's, that's, the, that's the number of jobs of town the size of sort of sterling, actually. So, you know, this is a big economic driver in that one. And then if you think about all the jobs created by all the people that are coming here, and, you know, you could not be in a better place in the world to understand the importance of international travel and what it means for culture, for uh, the economy, for, um, you know, like the whole social mix and everything else than be in Edinburgh in August. So, you know, it is vastly important, but we have choices to make. You know, I, I sit with, um, you know, sit with the tourism industry and the, the, the festival is desperately trying to grapple with this. How do they deal with it? If you've got international in your title, how are you going to be decarbonised if your acts are all coming from across the planet? And that's the point. And I'm just encouraging, like, don't be defeatist. You've got to, you've got to expect that the community, and I use that rather than society, community decides what they want to invest their value in, and it's not all money. And if we continue to decide that the arts festival is something we truly value, we'll find ways of putting that in the, girl, the bigger picture and prioritising it to a degree that we want to do it. Because, you know, it's all very well everybody saying, oh, we should do this, we should do that. What I tend to find when I'm talking to people is when they say we should fly less, what they mean is someone else should fly less. Because their decisions to fly are always really important. They always justify them, but they think everyone else's isn't. So I think this has got to be a community-led decision. It's a value-led decision, which will ultimately be political, because that's where we reflect our value system, uh, and that's where it'll come through in legislation. But it'd be very, very dangerous for people that are educated, understand the problem, understand the risks we're taking, to impose your solutions on other people, because one, it won't work, and two, I think it's quite arrogant. So we've got to ask people, what as a community do we want to protect when we're doing the decarbonisation? And, and, and the best way of doing that is demonstrate to everyone that we're doing the best version of decarbonisation as fast and as well as possible. Okay. Right. 
Now, that was a, sh a shameful Patsy question to his mate. Um, so I'm going to uh, ask uh, Finlay to come in. Is, can, I have a show of hands for people that are aware of the UK Citizens' Assembly on Climate. Okay, so can everyone that's not put their hands up go and have a read of this and have a read of the recommendations for aviation within there? That is a group of 50 or 100 Scottish citizens that are brought together to look at how to get to net zero by 2045. Um, which I think is, is too long a timeline. We're, we've got the next 10 years. But they looked at that and they said, we need to limit how much we fly. We need to tax aviation fuel. The further you fly, the more you should pay. We should have a frequent flyer levy. We should ban air miles. We should ban private jets. So those were all decisions that were voted on by representative groups of citizens across the Scotland. And this was done in the UK as well. And they had basically the exact same recommendations. So all of those things I just mentioned had... 60, 70, 80, 90 percent support on them. So listening to what the citizens of Scotland say, do you agree with those recommendations? Well, if we have, a, if we have a democracy, well, then if these things happen, they happen, because that's why decisions are made that way. I'm not necessarily saying I agree these will be the most effective ways of achieving decarbonisation. I think that's the point. It's, it's very easy to say, would you like something free? And they say yes. If you ask somebody, should somebody else pay more tax? They say yes. Um, the question is, do you understand the implication for employment? Do you understand the implication for Scottish universities where we send our kids free at the cost of all the Chinese and American students that pay for it? Do we understand that? And, and all I'm saying is let's make informed decisions about the implications of our choices. Decarbonisation is crucial. I'm not denying that. We have to do it as fast and as well as possible. Understand the choices you're making and make sure they're the best ones available. And just to be clear, the, the Citizens' Assembly took place over multiple weeks with multiple experts brought in, including from industry. They were massively in, informing the citizens that are making the decisions as a major pinnacle of that process. Um, and, and the Scottish Government ignored all of the recommendations on aviation and said it was a matter for UK government and the UK government isn't doing anything on this. Um, so that is listening to the community and it's, it's not listening. It's saying you can have a voice, but we're just going to ignore everything. I'm not in the government. Yes. I, I know you're not, but <laughs> some of us are. Oh, you, 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 you quickly learn in politics that con consultations are there to be ignored. Oh. Uh, by government. I'm not in government. <laughs> That's what happened, so folks. Yes. I'm not in government. I am an opposition MSP. Is that not part of government? No, it's that not. No, it's not. No. So you have no, no. I'm not in government. Whatsoever in your role, therefore you might as well not exist. Oh dear. <laughs> well, then we get into the whole question of democracy, uh, which yeah. is not which is not what this uh, meeting is about. Uh, but you know, people, people elect parliamentarians from different parties. We all have a role. We all have our say, and that's what Parliament's about. But I'm not in government. Now I'm going to go to the back. Green T-shirt. Thank you. Um, so I, I guess um, what I'm wondering is, uh, so it, Mike in his video, said he'd be surprised if the industry didn't recognize the need for us all to fly less. So I was, I was looking for a direct answer from each of the panelists. Do you think we need to fly less? Um, if you do, then how much, less, how, how much do we need to reduce that? If not, then is it fair for us in the developed Western world to fly as much as we do while the rest of the world doesn't? And is it sustainable for the rest of the world to fly as much as we do? Well, let's start with Charangate. Yeah. Um, it is an excellent question. Look, you know, I um, it is, uh, and, and I've got a couple of points on that because it's a really important question. And I do want to address this. Th there seems to be a theme that's that's either developed here or or it's commented on a few times. Um, you know, the develop the developing world world is flying, and uh, a lot of the growth for the industry is going to be coming from the developing world. Now, I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's it's a fact. So uh, I think it's um, it's. Um, it's, it's not quite accurate to say that it's just the West that, that, that is flying in. You know, you've got major airlines like Ethiopian Airlines is one of the biggest airlines in the world, you know. So I think it's, 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 it's false to, to say that, that it's just the West. I think the other aspect for, for and, and I've been reflecting on this, um, and we do have a sustainability strategy in the Global Chamber of Commerce Network. 
Um, and one of the principles that we have is to view one industry in isolation and ignore the rest is, is, is not a helpful start or a helpful approach. So this topic today is aviation and the sustainability agenda. It could easily be agriculture and the sustainability agenda. It could be house building and the sustainability agenda. So um, in, in direct answer, I think, to your question, um, taking this sector alone or agriculture on its own or whatever on its own, it's not going to be enough to solve the problems that we have all created as, as a global community. Whether you want to say it's the West or the South, that's up to you, but that, that's not my opinion. Um, secondly, should, should we fly less? I think that's a binary question. I, I don't think that's the right attitude to have because my earlier points in my opening remarks is an aircraft does not just fly people, uh, it flies uh, in very important products, goods to different markets around the world. Um, and we saw that not least during the pandemic when we were flying vaccines to other parts of the world, which is, uh, I, I'm sure we would all agree, an exceptionally important contribution that the industry has made and I'm sure will continue to make. But whether regulations are introduced to limit or curb what this industry does, that is, a, that is obviously a decision for governments and families already alluded to some of those policies have not been taken into consideration. I'm sure some might in the future, depending on what government gets into place, either in Scotland or, of course, uh, with the reserved issues in Westminster. But I think what is absolutely critical is, as, as a global community, um, in terms of, we were talking earlier about who's flying and who's not, we're, we've all become wealthier over decades and centuries. So I think to say it's just a small group of people that are flying contributes to it is clearly not correct. There's more people flying. We are becoming wealthier. There's more middle class emerging all around the world. So we do need to take the steps that others have alluded to and I did as well, whether it's SAF and fuels or whether it's in our domestic agenda and how we get people to airports and to and from. And the other aspect I think that's really important is um, some of the reasons and choices as to why we go to different markets and in the route we choose to get there. And obviously in this case, it's an aircraft and, and, and an aeroplane. It's for some people too expensive to stay at home and have a staycation. Staycations became quite big during the pandemic and then they've dropped off and people are now flying elsewhere. So I think there's a lot that we can do domestically for people to have more choices as to where the holiday. I don't think a lot of consumers don't set out to go abroad. They set out to go on a holiday and they have to do a cost benefit analysis as to where that happens. And as a business who's exporting, they will do the same as well. So I, th I think that's an important contribution in terms of how we factor these decisions in. There is obviously an element of, when we talked about fly shaming earlier, look, there's already regulation in place in, in the UK of where companies and individuals are shamed because they're not following particular policies. Um, you know, there's high taxes on diesel cars, for example. The, you know, the road tax was, I think, tripled several years ago, but people are still buying diesel cars because getting an electric one for some in different geographies around the country is effectively pointless because they can't charge it and the charging network in Scotland in particular is a very poor network. It's unreliable. Um, so I think the shaming agenda, other policies have already shown us that it doesn't work. So we need to learn from that and understand well what could work and the majority of it is around better informed choices. And the, the, the final comment I do, I do want to make on, 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 the, um, on the information education is we all want thriving high streets in all of our communities and you know, a staple in all of high streets is, is, is a local travel agent. Um, and we saw during the pandemic uh, travel agents and agencies offering really important support around what people wanted to do with their leisure time. So re-educating um, uh, our local high street retailers in this area is going to be really important so that they can understand how do we offer choices that are carbon friendly or carbon neutral that doesn't always involve flying. So I think there's a lot the industry is already doing in that front um, but there is a lot more to do as well and, and the choices part is, is, is going to be a really difficult one to counter um, because as Gordon said earlier we do talk about flying less but we never necessarily think it's for ourselves uh, doing that so there's a lot um, there's a long journey to go on that front. Okay, good. Um, good, good answer, Charandy. Good, extensive answer. The other two, you both had good airtime. So, quick answer: Should we fly less? Um, we need to decarbonise aviation. If we don't, we will end up being forced to fly less because it will be taxed or it will be restricted in some way or other. So, the challenge for the industry is decarbonise. And if we don't, we will have less people flying. As simple as that. So, but I'm up for the challenge of decarbonising the industry. 
Um, yeah, so it, it's a budgeting problem and we need to read half emissions in the next 10 years um, and we have to look at other sectors. When you look at other sectors, they're blowing their own budgets, so there isn't wiggle room. So that means aviation has the budget it has now um, and there is no way to half emissions in the next 10 years without flying less. However, do we need to fly less? It depends who you are. The majority of people that produce the majority of emissions are the 1% of the planet. Um, even in the UK, half of people don't fly. Um, the people that do fly once or twice that make up the next 25% fly once to Spain or to Italy. That's kind of like equivalent to your emissions from driving your car for a couple of months, say. So there's a minority of the planet, and it is a minority, and, and across all countries, that, well, but in the UK more so than others, in the US as well, um, that, that do the predominant amount of flying and produce the predominant emissions, and they need to cut back, but the average person uh, this is barely going to affect, and it's, that's quite an important point to get across. Thank you. I've got time for two more from the audience, and then we'll have to uh, wrap it up. So, you know, lady down the front, and, and then the guy just behind her. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm from Indonesia. I've come here for, for, for study. I work for a line company, and I also have worked uh, for FMCG company, so it is really le relatable that you said about cargo, because uh, back then, like 10 years ago, like in my country, uh, we sell like four like dairy products and then uh, to distribute the products like until uh, to the east to the west, it almost uh, spend more, most of the time, it almost expired to come to the, to come to the distributor. So, you know, like the affordable of the cargo is actually, um, you know, has developed us, the, has developed the, have us the, the industry. And, you know, talking about the car, uh, the, the, price carbon uh, the carbon price that you mentioned maybe it's just a sharing you know like what happened in uh, our country like uh it's an archipelago country so we have no um toll or access under the sea so yeah if you come from east to west maybe it's to west uh, it's, it's 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 quite like from here to america so it's, it's quite far and you know there was like one domestic um airline you mentioned um maybe uh it is known for the worst on-time performance, but because it's very cheap, yeah. So yeah, is the is the is the most wanted is the most wanted airline, even it's uh, for the worst uh, on-time performance and etc. So yeah, it is it is hard for people who live in a um, you know like in a developing country like ours maybe to you mentioned about the, about the carbon price and then you mentioned about the even like um, if F to the to the FMCG industry and, and everything, yeah. So maybe, I don't know, like I, I, Ayata also talking about this kind of things. Yeah, maybe this is the thing that we, as an employer in this industry, that also think of solve this kind of issue. Yeah, just sharing. Very quick response from Chairman Deep only yeah you, I, I, th I think you've you know you've answered you know you, you've made you, you've you've made an exceptionally important point and you've and you've seen it you know in in reality. Um, and this is why the Chambers of Commerce exists. It is, it's to spread economic prosperity across every community around the world. But that doesn't mean that we're not aware of the challenges and drawbacks in and around that. So, you know, we completely understand. But you've seen that at the coalface the prosperity that's been brought to the company's community that you operated in as a result of having um, an aircraft that took that project, produce on time and, 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 and it didn't expire on, on route and, 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 and the supplier received it. What, what I would say in terms of that drawback aspect, because there'll be people in the room thinking, well, just because it's bringing prosperity, does that mean we just forget about everything else? Well, no, no, it doesn't. We do have to understand how we can get efficient and, 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 and smarter about it. But we do need to also be honest about if we stop doing X activity, then what impact does that have on, in, on Scotland's economy, on the communities that we operate in? What does it do to jobs? What does, what does it do to people's livelihoods? And if we understand the impact that it can have on that, then what solutions are we offering those communities? Because ultimately, if we can take communities with us, then we can get to the solutions potentially faster. Um, and that, I think, has to be the driving force around all of this. But it can't just be about Scotland. It has to be about our international partners as well. This can't just be a Scotland narrow focus only. It has to be about if we are exporting and importing from a country like Indonesia, and we decide to implement a you know, carbon tax policy that might make it uncompetitive to import or export, what does that do to the suppliers that we're working with? Um, because this can't just be a narrow focus on Scotland. Okay. And the final contribution from the audience, yourself. Yeah. Um, um
private sector here yeah. and, and their role. And with private sector, in this context, I mean those who design aircraft and those who buy, lease, and then operate them as well. That, that's my, uh, my definition for the moment of private sector. Um, being in the private sector myself, of course, we're all driven by the consumer demand. Uh, and we're also driven to, to have a bit of a unique selling point to differentiate us from competitors. And that drives a lot of innovation within our businesses. Um, so, with the dawn of artificial intelligence, for example, we've now recently seen that the technology was created, there was clearly a need for it, and then there was calls for regulation at governmental level. And if I use a recent example that affected all of us during the pandemic, we originally were told that we can't get a vaccine because it takes years and years and years. And lo and behold, it became a matter of life and death. And the mm -hmm. private sector very quickly proved it's possible, and regulation followed. So my question to each of the panelists is, who here doesn't get that this is a matter of life and death? Is it the government, in your opinion? Is it the private sector? Or indeed, is it the consumer who just happens to be the employer of the public sector as well? I have a funny feeling that a lot of the suggestions that are coming out of everybody's mouth is to shame the latter mm. and to make this the general public's problem. Whereas my expectation, coming from the private sector, is I need airlines to buy well-designed aircraft that fly sustainably. Why are they not proving the technology just like the wind energy? No government would have invested in that or regulated that if it was a bad idea or it, it couldn't be done. Yeah. Right. So, um, now, before you respond, we have to finish in about two minutes. Uh, otherwise, we're going to get thrown out. So what, what I'm going to ask you is to wrap up. If you want to answer that, that's your wrapping up done. Okay. If you don't, you can say something else. So we'll start with you, Finley. OK, so definitely not the consumer's fault. They've been greenwashed massively by private companies um, and the government's been complicit in that. Um, who's, whose fault is this? It's, it's the free market, which is determining short-term profit over long-term risk. So CEOs of companies and governments, government politicians, are only going to be in office for the next few years and then they're out. They need to return, they, ne they need to deliver quarterly profits. They need annual reports where they're delivered and they don't want to take on massive costs in the short term to do what's necessary to reconfigure uh, their factories, their airports, their way of doing things. All of that's cost, it's additional employment, which is good for us workers, which is why we're pushing for it. But we've got the market against us and we've got the current systems that are in place commercially and within politics, which is why, in order to address this, we need to transform the way we do politics um, and the way that we do business. Okay, thank you. Jordan. I think it's a great way to finish, and I, th I think the answer will come from the private sector, and it will come when the incentives are right, and, and this is whether it's regulation-based, whether it's pricing-based. But I think the one thing that struck me back in COP26, which I know a lot of people saw as a bit disappointing and not really advancing the thing, but the thing that really clicked over was that was when the finance industry started paying attention to this. And you see this differently now. I'm owned by a private equity firm. You see this when every single investment has got to have a really solid sustainability agenda along with it now. People are pulling out markets. You know, nobody's buying coal anymore. All, all of these things are happening. At the private sector, finance-led value system because people are now pricing in the long-term impact of not being sustainable, not decarbonising. So in a sense, it's already clicked. Now, you can ask the question perfectly fairly, why didn't we start this 20 years ago? But you can only plant the tree today, you can't plant the tree in history. So you, all you, all, what I think I would believe with is if you think about that example of COVID and how fast things think, we are now on that trajectory. We've not been trying very hard to date. I think the private sector and industry and particularly where the money is going, which is where it really drives the thing that you, you know, we definitely agree on that. The money is going into this now, so we will see rapid advance. And Charity. Just very quickly, I've been told to wrap up quick. I, I think it needs to be public and private working together. It needs to be absolutely joint. Actually, the pandemic proved that if government legislation allows companies to develop uh, vaccines quickly, uh, but, but being safe, then it can happen faster. Um, I think right now we are seeing a big shift in how customers are challenging companies as well. And that's at the boardroom and shareholder level as well. We're seeing more activist shareholders getting out there. I think that's a good thing. I think we need more shareholders raising their voice and actually demanding more from the private sector because we can do more and should do more. Um, and that's not at the expense of people or planet or profit. I think all can coexist together. Um, but the government is not moving fast enough 
uh, but the private sector solutions are moving fast, but government has to come to the table as well. But it definitely has to be joint. Thank you very much. Can we uh, thank uh, our speakers, Charandeep, Gordon and Finlay. And can I also thank you for attending, particularly the people who have come from abroad. It's really good to see you here. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been really, uh, I think it's been a really good session. I'm off to take my tie off uh, <laughs> and uh, tell my wife something that she knew already, which is that I'm utterly pointless. So thank, <laughs> thank you and good night. I don't have a tie.